past uh, September, my wife and I and uh, my two friends uh, visited Normandy. Now that's an eye opener. Uh, we uh, walked the beaches where our kids fought and died. The biggest, uh, I don't know what you would call it. Uh, uh, we visited the, uh, the cemetery, the American cemetery. Now, that's an eye-opener, and that's why we're here today, to honor these kids that I walked amongst the white crosses and looked at the dates and the ages of these kids, 18, 19, 20 year olds, and the date that they died, June 6, 1944, the cemetery, you can't believe it if you haven't been there, for acres and acres of white crosses. So that's why we're here today to honor of these kids that never made it back home, never had a, another Christmas. You have to excuse me, I get a little emotional on this thing. I was invited down here today to talk about the Indianapolis. The Indianapolis was a heavy cruiser. She was commissioned in 1932. She was probably one of the uh, first warships that were built after World War I. And during the 30s, the Indianapolis was a ship of state. She was uh, President Roosevelt's cruiser. He used her to travel most of the world, South America and all the other points. And they had his a special bed on there for him and also room for his uh, wheelchair. He was a cripple, he could not walk. He could stand but not walk. And uh, during, in 1940-41, when the war came along, she was out around uh, Pearl Harbor. She was not in port when the Japs bombed. She was out around the Johnson Islands patrolling. But then she got the word that the Japanese were bombing Pearl Harbor, and of course she was late getting back, and the Japanese were already gone when the when she got back. But during the war, during the 40s, she uh, was in 10 battles in the South Pacific. She had 10 battle stars. She fought and uh, liberated Tinian, Guam, all the Marianas. She was in all those battles. And uh, she earned 10 battle stars. In 1945, Easter Sunday of 45, she was at bombarding in Okinawa, and she took a suicide plane that uh, the bomb went completely through the ship, down the number two stack, went through number two chow hall, went through a table, nine guys got killed, the bomb went exactly right through the ship, blew up underneath the ship, and somehow they got the compartment sealed off, and she made her way back to Mare Island by herself, under her own power. Wow. So, she was under repair when I got on board. Uh, I, I joined the Navy, I was in my last year of high school, and uh, all the guys that I ever ran around with were older and they were either being drafted or, or enlisting and I thought I was missing out on a lot of fun so I, I talked my dad into uh, signing me in. I was 17 years old and uh, my mother didn't think too much of that but, but uh, I pestered him until he signed up, me up. And I took my boot camp at Great Lakes, Illinois and uh, 
I was there for three months in training, and I got out on April the 12th, the day President Roosevelt died. And that was how we can remember that date. And after uh, a little uh, leave they gave us, a uh, boot camp leave, they uh, put us on a troop train, and we ended up five days later uh, right over here at Camp Stoneman, the dispersing center. And uh, I was there for like two weeks waiting for uh, an assignment. Finally came along as posted, I was assigned to USS Indianapolis at Mare Island. There was, I think, 12 of us out of my boot camp, camp company that went on board at the same time. And we were at Mare Island uh, from, uh, I think I boarded her around the middle of May. And uh, of course, we stood all the fire watches while the yard birds worked on her and rebuilt her. And she looked brand new. Uh, and we went out on sea trials and everything worked. So uh, one morning we woke up and we were ordered out to sea. And uh, the yard birds were still pulling cords off the, and taking welders off the ship, and, but we were out of there. So uh, we stopped at uh, Hunter's Point and uh, we picked up what turned it was a big crate. Everybody's trying to guess what was in it. Well, what was in it was the first bomb or the parts of the bomb that was dropped, dropped on Hiroshima. We uh, started out from uh, Hunter's Point, and uh, our first stop was Pearl Harbor, where we delivered 200 passengers, or kids that were being dispersed to different ships and stations out in the South Pacific. And then uh, it, that was, uh, and it still holds today for that type of ship, this high speed run with 74 hours it took us to get to Pearl Harbor. And uh, I'm telling you what, we were taking water over the fantail. We were doing 32, 35 knots, that big ship. She was really traveling. It was something that I, uh, I always remember her as a fantastic, this big old ship was going that fast. Anyhow, we dropped the kids off at uh, Pearl Harbor and went on to Tinian in the Marianas and we dropped off this bomb, turned out to be the bomb, at Tinian where the B-29s loaded her up. From, we, from there we went to uh, uh, Guam and uh, we were loading ammunition for the big push to Japan. And uh, while we were there, the skipper asked for an escort because we were heading into uh, the Philippine Sea and, and, and uh, uh, thinking that there were some Japs hanging around. So the, uh, they refused us an escort. So we didn't need it. There was no action in that area. So the skipper was refused uh, an escort. So we left Guam, and it was really hot. The skipper let us sleep topside wherever we want to sleep, and uh, just to get some air, because there's no air conditioning in this boat. So two days out of Guam, two nights, I should say, out of Guam, I was sleeping topside for the first time. Uh, the, the area or the compartment I was sleeping, was supposed to be sleeping in, was three decks down, and that's where the first torpedo hit. She hit, uh, I was sleeping out underneath number two gun turret, and when the torpedo hit, I didn't know it was a torpedo, I thought the boiler blew or something, because I looked up and the fire was coming out of number one stack, so I thought maybe it blew a boiler. And then I, it rolled me off that ledge, I reached for my shoes, my shoes, went over the side. So I got down on the quarter deck, and there was so much confusion down there. I, I tried to get down to my battle station, but there was fire and smoke. So I went aft to my uh, shop. I was a ship fitter, striker. That's repair division. 
And I uh, went through the port hangar deck and there was someone in there throwing out life jackets. So I grabbed one of those and went and started aft. I got to the fantail and there was a, one of the sailors there was hurt pretty bad. He was bleeding and I gave him my life jacket. Went back and got another one. And finally made it back to the fantail. Never to my shop, but the shop was almost underwater by then. And there was a, one of the guys, we call him Frenchy, and he was escaped from the Germans earlier in, in the war and joined our Navy. He said, you better get going, Bray, she's going down. I said, I don't think so. Like, where are we going to go, you know, she goes down. So when I went on the, over the side, the mast was already in the water. So I had to pull myself up over the lifeline on the side of the ship. And uh, I, the screws were still turning. One was out of the water, still turning, so we were still underway. I ran down the side of the ship to the quarter deck, and that's where I jumped off. I hit the water, and somebody hit me. I mean, drove me, I don't know, drove me down. And, I opened up my eyes underwater and I seen this big shadow. I thought the ship was coming down on top of me, but it was, it was oil slick on the water. So I broke the water and uh, I started swimming away. And I looked back and she was up on her bow going down. And there were still guys coming off. It was like, it was like ants on a stick. The moon was out and you could see these kids coming off and hitting the water. Now they predicted that Three of us, uh, three out uh, of 300 got killed instantly, and 900 got back into water. I don't know how they figured that out, but anyhow, I swam away from her, and I come upon this uh, net. There was a sailor sitting on top of it. It was all bundled up. Somehow we got it un unraveled, and it floated out. It was a floater net, had corks, through hemp rope and floated out to maybe 40 feet square. And we start picking up survivors. And uh, I don't know where the raft came from. There was one raft. We tied it to the, to the net. And uh, in the morning when we counted off, we had picked up 140 guys. And that was the biggest group that was uh, uh, rescued when we were rescued, but it wasn't 140 when we got rescued. The, the first day in the water, we were in the water 24-7. There was no way you were going to be dry. And these k pop life jackets that we had are only good for 72 hours. So we were in the water for a approximately 140 hours, and these life jackets were given up. Anyhow, the first day, everybody was saying, well, we should be getting picked up, we should be rescued, we must have had an SOS out. Well, CIC was hit, so we were told there was no uh, SOS. So the first day, those big fish showed up, and they started taking the toll. Anybody that was hurt very bad never lasted but a couple of days. Second, and uh, every day we saw airplanes flew over us every day, but they were way too high, I guess at 10,000 feet. The ocean looks like a block of cement. So every day we saw airplanes. Second day, things got a little rough. We didn't have any food, we didn't have any water. So the guys started drinking salt water and that didn't do them any good. Now I must have listened to boot camp because I didn't touch a drop of that nasty stuff. It was. It was, I mean, you pour a, a cup of salt in a cup of water and that's what it tastes like. So they're, the guys that drank it, they're the ones that caused all the trouble. 
attacking other guys, and I never saw much of that, but uh, that's what happened. Uh, the second and third day, guys swam away, and then they'd come back and say, hey, come on over, we, we found this island. There's all kinds of girls over there, come on, let's go. And of course, they had guys that were, would go and never come back, of course. Third day was the same. Our group was getting smaller. And uh, the fourth day, there was uh, this bomber came. This is uh, one of our own uh, Navy bombers came over us. And he didn't know what he had seen. And how he saw us was one of the guys were, were checking what they called a uh, trailing antenna, which broke off an airplane. And he was laying down and pulling this antenna back in. And he seen this oil slick. So he tells the pilot about the oil slick. And the pilot goes down, thinking it's a Jap sub. And they were re ready to drop depth charges on us. But they went over us, and they saw little heads bobbing up in his oil slick, and they went over us, and they gave us a wing thing. He came back and did it again, and at that point, he radioed, he radioed and exactly what he said were fish on the pond, meaning there's survivors in the water, and uh, he radioed his station, and that's when the rescue started. That was four and a half days we were in the water. Now, when they start dropping things to us, like can water, uh, stuff that you can make drinking water out of the ocean water, and uh, they dropped what I thought was a tank of water, and I swam away from the group and uh, f found this, but all it was was a antenna and a microphone, and I, years later when I talked to the uh, pilot of the airplane, he said I could have pulled it up and talked to him, but I was in no mood to talk to him. I wanted a drink of water. It, <laughs> anyhow, I didn't go back to the group. because They were screaming and hollering, and I thought the sharks were after them. So there was a raft laying off with two guys on it, and I swam to it, and I got on that. And there was no bottom to the raft. It was just a ring. and. Uh, Sometime during that night, these two guys disappeared. They might have got a rubber raft that they dropped, or, or I don't know what happened to them. I didn't know them. You wouldn't have known your brother anyhow if you were sitting next to you. You were covered with diesel oil. Anyhow, the, early the next morning, the spotlight hit me. And I don't care if it was the Japs. I was getting on their boat. I don't care what. <laughs> Anyhow, it turned out to be a, a LCV from the, uh, the uh, uh, ship called the Bassett. She was a demolition transport, which she came out to help with the rescue. Uh, so this Higgins boat pulled up to me and says, and threw a Jacob's ladder over the side, so, okay, Stellar, here you go, come on up. <laughs> yeah, right. Two of them jumped in and got me and pushed me up on the uh, inside the boat and uh, strapped me into this, uh, looked like a, a stretcher. And uh, I don't remember them taking anybody else up that with me, but they took me back to the mothership, the Bassett, and uh, they hooked me up and pulled me up on the deck of the Bassett. And that's the last thing I remember until uh, we pulled into the Philippines and uh, into the hospital there uh, on Samar. Uh, one time I did wake up during the, the, the time uh, on the boat and uh, there was a sailor cleaning the oil out of my eyes and I grabbed him and he, I, was, I don't know what he was doing. So he says, that's okay sailor. He says, he says I'm just cleaning you up. And they did. I don't know how they got the oil off of us, but uh, uh, we were pretty much cleaned up when we uh, got to the Philippines. And they unloaded us at, uh, uh, at the Philippine Hospital, Samar, S-A-M, 
A-R, I think that's how you spell it, in, in the Philippines. And then they had Marine guards all around us. Uh, uh, they didn't want us talking to anybody. Uh, I don't know why, and, and during the time we were in the ward, the two Marines got killed by the Japs that were in the, still in the trees there. So uh, they kind of kept us uh, there for, uh, I think maybe three weeks we were in the hospital there. And then they transported us by air to Guam. And during this time, we, th we thought we were the only ones alive. But we got split up in the water, depending on when, when and where you went over the side, there's a group you got in. So uh, one group, that, our group went to the Philippines, and another group went to Palalu, and another group went to Guam. So we all got together in Guam. There was 317 of us left alive. And after we got picked up, two guys died after we got picked up, so uh, they still count him as a survivor. But. So we flew to Guam, and we were in a rest camp, a submarine rest camp uh, on Guam, where they tried to fatten us up. I lost 35 pounds in the water. Wow. So when you're not eating and not drinking, your body eats yourself up. So that's what they told us anyhow. But. Anyhow, I get the weight back, and uh, as you can see. <laughs> uh, then we stayed at the hospital uh, in Guam uh, for another two, three weeks. And then they put us on an aircraft carrier, the Hollandia, and we transported us back to San Diego, uh, the Marine base there in San Diego. And we didn't have any uniforms. All we had was or whatever the Red Cross gave us on Guam. And that was uh, like dungarees or skivvies or something. I can't remember that part. Anyhow, they started issuing us uniforms. And there were, some were too big, some were too small. They turned us out on the street. The MPs, SP started picking us up for being out of uniform. <laughs> there was a big fiasco. So we finally got that straightened out, and uh, they gave us a, a 36 day survivor's leave and sent us all on our way to different stations. Now, they let us choose where we wanted to be stationed after we got home. And I chose a little airfield right outside of Detroit, away from the water. <laughs> yeah. You know, the funny thing about that is uh, when I arrived at that station, they still had German prisoners there. So they gave us a group of German prisoners to, to police. They gave me a, I had 35 prisoners and a little billy club. And these Germans were monster guys, they're big guys. <laughs> but none of them really wanted to go home, so they behaved pretty well. But uh, I uh, had a load of them. I tell this little story. It's kind of funny, but not to them. And you know, I, I had a, a bunch in the back of a dump truck, and I was cleaning the runway, and I had my trans, uh, the, the guy, translator in the, in the front seat with me, and he fell asleep. And the old dump trucks had these levers that kicked the dump up. Well, he kicked the lever, and <laughs> the dump went up, and these guys were hanging on for their dear life. <laughs> I was going down the runway not knowing where. You know. I never lost any of them, but it, was a, it turned out OK. But, uh, I, I stayed there at this station for about a year and a half, and then uh, they got rid of me, discharged me out of the Navy. And, uh, and after the Navy, I, uh, I knew where the sun shined. I, was, uh, I came back out to California, and that's where I stayed. I've been uh, here in Benicia for the last, since 1948, so I guess I found a home. So, uh, I uh, retired from the Benicia Police Department. I had 23 years with them. And then uh, I uh, kind of worked with my son on uh, his construction. He fired me a couple of times, but uh, uh, no, he didn't. We, uh, but then after that, I uh, worked at the golf course sometimes. 
then I got to be too much, so now I just hang out at the house and play golf, so. <laughs> I'll take questions if anybody, uh, that's about the end of my uh, experience, so any questions? Not you. <laughs> oh, I know what she's gonna say. At the end of, just a minute, at the end of the, uh, this, the Navy court-martialed our captain. That's what we were gonna say, right? Yeah. Well, they, they uh, said that he endangered the ship and didn't zigzag. Well, zigzagging during wartime, that helped with the old submarines. But the guy that got us, they brought him to Washington, D.C. and testified against our skipper. I didn't go to the trial because it wasn't on, on uh, watch. I was sleeping at the time. But uh, this Jap commander came over and he told the court martial, he said, no matter what the ship was doing, I would have shot him anyhow. He had one of the newest Jap subs out, and, and matter of fact, the sub that he had had an airplane on it. How they did that, I don't know. But the court martial didn't believe him either, and uh, they convicted our skipper. Uh, all that happened to him, he lost points as an admiral, and he couldn't command a ship anymore. But in 1969, he shot himself over this. He, he uh, went out on his front porch and, and uh, shot himself. So the Navy finally exonerated the skipper through efforts of ours, to see the, uh, the uh, survivors, and also this young man, uh, where was he from? Hunter, his name was Hunter Scott from where though? I don't know, he, he came to one of our reunions and he had a, a, a school project he did on the Indianapolis. He had a beautiful display. And uh, he uh, went to Washington and testified for us, and several of the survivors did too. And uh, finally, uh, they did exonerate the skipper on, on both counts. He never lived to know it, but his sons, he had two sons, and uh, one just died, uh, lived in uh, Honolulu, and he just passed on, but he lived to find that his dad was exonerated. Is it all? <laughs> My coach over here, she follows me all over the place. Uh, I, uh, she did make me a little list of stuff here, but I, I kind of, uh, I got it all though. <laughs> a question? So you move to where the sun shines, do you pronounce it Benicia or Benicia? Well, I call it Benicia. Thank you, sir. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. You said you have reunions with the survivors. Yes, I do. How often do you do that, and how many of them are left? Well, we meet every year uh -huh. in Indianapolis, oh, cool. and uh, there was uh, last count last week was 42. Mm -hmm. I'm the youngest of the group, so, oh, wow. and I'm 85, so you know, older. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you. This this gentleman has this gentleman is talking. He was a lieutenant JG in the Navy. Were you? Yes, a lieutenant JG. So. Thank you for remembering.